everyone. Uh, I am here with Ron Pirantosi, uh, one of the partners in a consulting company now called Cameron and Associates, uh, and an adjunct professor at Babson College. Uh, but for our purposes, uh, what's interesting is his former role uh, leading innovation at Air Products and Chemicals. Uh, so Ron, thank you so much for being part of this process. My pleasure, Rita. Good to be, good to see you and good to see your group. Absolutely. So maybe start off just with, you know, you, you know, who's Ron? What's his background? How did you get sure. to air products in the first place? So, as Rita mentioned, I come from the chemical industry. I'm a chemist by training. Uh, I spent, uh, as I call my formative years as a research scientist and then became a technology director and then uh, ran new business development and innovation at air products uh, till I decided to leave in 2007. And from that point on, I've been doing, I've been teaching, consulting, working with startups and large global companies, implementing tools and approaches to dealing with transformational growth and, and dealing with uncertainty. That's fantastic. So you were one of the very first companies, Air Products was like this, to adopt discovery-driven planning on a, on a big scale. And um, as I recall, you went about it pretty methodically, like building out the tools and the framework and understanding what the common language was. And maybe take us through the phases of that, because I know yeah. it took a while. Yeah, it took quite a while. And uh, what the way we did it was, well, it started with kind of our innovation group that I was running. And I, I sent a few folks to Wharton at the time where you and, and Ian McMillan um, were uh, and Alex Van Putten were teaching the class on discovery driven planning. And then we came, they came back, it was I think three folks went to the class. And then we began to pilot it in, in various projects. And once we started to see kind of the power of understanding, uh, you know, our uncertainties going into a project, we then started to roll out training and we, we selected projects for training programs. And uh, all the training was done with real projects, no case studies, no, you know, nothing but things that made sense. So everybody that came into the training program had uh, kind of skin in the game, if you will. Uh, it was their project and they had to make it work and we had management buy-in for that. And then we slowly moved it from the innovation group to more of the R&D projects, to the marketing groups, and began to get really high level buy-in across the corporation with one of the strong advocates being the CFO. Since, since there's a lot of, uh, Paul Huck at the time was the um, CFO of our products. Mm -hmm. And um, what that did was allowed us to use, you know, discovery driven planning as kind of a, the financial go by, if you will, instead of getting into detailed financial analysis. And, and Paul really gra grasped this concepts of uh, options and options thinking and spend a little to learn kind of concept and so that that really helped us expand it pretty broadly and we, and it for a long time uh, it became kind of the go-to methodology for any new opportunity but you didn't start it with a top-down mandate no we didn't uh, the top-down mandate we had was really around finding new growth opportunities mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that was actually the top-down mandate. We were left to the idea of, you know, how do you do, how do you assess uh, new opportunities? How do you how do you deal with them? And and it was left up to us, me, uh, to to bring in the tools. And you know, you you quickly realize things like traditional stage gate processes, tra traditional project management doesn't work because you know we're not going to put together, a, you know, class one. Um, capital expense authorization on an idea you know, right. <laughs> that doesn't work and uh, and you know so we had to deal with how do we how do we deal things that are really unknown and at the time you know when you think about it it was around 2001 2002 we were dealing thing with things like you know the advent of flexible displays and the materials for that you know electronic coatings that you know, make windows go dark and light. You know, there were a whole lot of new technologies that the world was trying to discover, let alone, you know, turn into products. Mm -hmm. And so the, the level of unknowns were pretty high. Mm -hmm. And so we had, to, we had to find ways to deal with the unknowns. And so we started to scour academic literature, read books, do, do all the normal things you would do as a scientist, right? As a scientist, that's the only way I knew how to do it. And, and that's when we started to bring in experts to kind of teach us what mm -hmm. to do and how to do it. 
Yeah, and you talked about building out the tool set, you know, kind of step by step creating the tools that were appropriate to these high uncertainty situations, of which discovery driven planning was one, but there were many others that you used as well. Yeah, there were a lot of others. We 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 focused a lot on work of by your, you, of course you and and your your group at Wharton at the time, and uh, and as well as Gina O'Connor at RPI, mm -hmm. who's now my colleague at Babson, uh, on the earlier stages of how do you how do you identify unknowns in disruptive technology. We did a lot of strategy work with people like Gary Hamill uh, and and others, and kind of incorporated you know. Uh, what I might call best practices approach to us. You know, when do you, you know, what do you use? How do you do it? Where do you go? We did a lot of work with Dan Adams uh, at the uh, uh, Advanced uh, Innovation and Marketing Group. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dan um, taught us how to go out and identify customer needs in a B2B market. Mm -hmm. uh, B2C, a lot, you know, there's a lot of tools out there, books and upon books and courses upon courses are, are developed for it. But in B2B, it's a lot different because you're really focused on, you know, data. You're focused on what are the customers really trying to accomplish. If I, if I provide a product in this part of their supply chain, what do I do to the rest of it kind of thing? And, and so Dan, Dan had, gave us that tool. And so we, we started to incorporate this into kind of a process for how do you lay out the assumptions where, you, where, you, uh, where do you uh, uh, go out and how do you go out and test them? And a lot of times it's their early stages, it's all about markets mm -hmm. and customers and what they're trying to get done. So in that early negotiation around finding growth opportunities, how was the budget set up? Um, it was interesting because we never really had a big pile of money. The budget was set up that I had exploratory money and I had a pretty good link to what was then the corporate R&D group. So we worked very closely with the, the technology organization to do any of the R&D. Uh, my team did all the early marketing work. So it was around identifying the market, putting together the case to, to do something, and then identify, you know, sit down with the scientists, say, you know, what are the technology hurdles? What's going to go on here? And that would lead to eventually lead to R&D projects or investments in startup companies. We also used, we viewed venture capital and university research as uh, ways to explore, you know, the next generation uh, technologies. Mm -hmm. So pretty small budget, but lots of ties elsewhere in the organization. Yeah, lots of ties elsewhere. And the ability to work with senior management, we had a, an innovation board, we called it the growth board, um, which was which was there to supply resources and budget when we needed. So we would present and you know debate how much money we need. And, and that was where uh, someone like Paul Hawk, the CFO, was really good. I can remember a meeting presenting a, 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 an investment we wanted to do and, and and every investment we did at a startup company, we also had R&D projects coincided with it as joint development. And we laid out the plan to Paul and said, here's my, here's what we need to spend in the next four months. And he said, so what you're telling me, I can remember the conversation as though it were yesterday. He said, what you're telling me is my downside is X. He said, and at the end of that, you're going to, you're going to have more information to tell me whether I should invest more. He goes, I'm all in. Which is very enlightened for a CFO. Yeah, well, you know, it was Paul, I think he was at the time also uh, doing some teaching adjunct and he was teaching options. So <laughs> it really helped. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, having the CFO as, as a champion is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes how they you do make financial decisions and budget decisions drive the culture in a company, right? They do. Yeah. Oh, they do. So one of the things we talk about a lot is aligning um your strategy which when it's done right that's pulling you into the future right your budgeting as we've just discussed which often is an anchor to the past right your project governance which is usually i mean in most companies i work with it's a hot mess i mean it's like you pick the lid up off it and it's like yeah. the CEO's pet bunny from four ceos ago and then how people get compensated or what they what they feel is going to get them ahead and all those things are typically wildly out of alignment yeah, one of the problems with project management today is that everybody keeps trying to codify one project management tool to fit everything. And that still continues, whether it's StageGate, whether it's DDP, 
their, their tool, you know, it's like any toolbox, right? You know, the right tool at the time. And, and there's timing for this. You go back to the work of Gina O'Connor on the learning plan. You know, she and I co-authored a paper in 2008. That's very early stage. It's kind of like, I'm not sure what market. I have an idea for a novel technology. I don't know where exactly it fits. And I'm not even sure how the technology is going to pan out. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a whole pile of uncertainties. And, um, and then you get to DDP, which is, okay, now I have an idea where it fits. Now can I make money doing this? And what's it going to cost me to get there? And once you get through that and turn things into facts, then you got StageGate, which is a methodical way to make sure you execute all the, you know, cross the T's, dot the I's kind of thing. And then you have capital management, which is how do I spend $100 million to make money? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it's, it's not one tool. And this is where, where, you know, when you talk about implementation in a company, where there's a lot of coaching. We, I probably spend most of my time these days coaching both senior managers and project teams on what to do at different stages of the evolution of a project and, and where you use certain tools. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes a lot of uh, uh, coaching to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why, you know, when we talk about our air products experience together, you guys were in there, you know, there, there were times I didn't even know you were in town and, <laughs> <laughs> and people come me, Hey, I had a great meeting with Rita and, and Mac, you know, uh, and I'm like, really? I said, so I'll get the bill next week. Is that what you're telling me? You know, it was that kind of thing. And, and that's the way it has to happen. You're, you're really a coach on the projects. In terms of alignment with the strategy, we use this thing called domains, uh, which we, we structured around, you know, you have your existing domains, which are the things you're making money, the core of your business today. But then you have areas that you need to identify, which are my target domains for the future growth. And unless you have a commitment to invest in those target domains over a period of time, depending on what industry you're in, Right. In, in social media, it might be three nanoseconds in, in, in energy. It might be 10 years. And, and so, you know, what are the growth domains and how are you going to start populating that with ideas? So it requires that whole process of idea generation unknowns. And, and again, you know, structuring that and having commitment to that at the top. You don't have to worry so much about how you're going to. Uh, governing, although that's important, but it's around, you know, we're going to commit to entering these domains, whether it's an alternative energy domain or, or, uh, or, you know, we're going to digitize everything we do. And how did you get that commitment? Because I see so many companies struggling with, we, you know, we, we have to deliver something in an 18 month time horizon, yeah. and that, you know, it, that kind it, of thing. It's extremely difficult, and and I'm not sure we ever had complete commitment for some of the things we were doing. Uh, we had commitment on certain aspects of it, um, and in today, you know, as I said, when we're we're working, we're spending a lot of time talking about and helping companies articulate their domains and what they mean, and at least getting some buy-in from the C-suite level to say look, this is where we're going to invest, whether it's R&D dollars, innovation dollars, business development, whatever you want to call it. This is where we have to invest the money. And, 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 and you're starting to see now a, a I, I'm starting to see more and more companies think this way. Mm. Okay. Can you see progress? And, yeah, it's, I, I think there's real progress. <laughs> whether they're investing behind it, we'll see. Um, but, you know, you go to companies, there's, there's public domain information out there. And if you go to places like Grundfos in Denmark, they've done a really nice job of articulating things like clean water as and they make pumps for the water industry. They make hydraulic pumps. And so they have a clean water domain that they start to, to populate with ideas and opportunities. And that's kind of what companies need to do, you know, envision your future and then work your way backwards. Mm -hmm. And say, so, you know, now I can populate the opportunities. And then, and then from there, how do you manage those opportunities? Well, it's not like, oh, I see this opportunity to invest in this business. So let's throw a hundred million dollars at it. No, not quite. Um, and, and so that's where you start thinking about this, this options mentality of I spend a little to learn that gives me the right to the next expenditure, but not the obligation to do it. 
<laughs> so, so in these domain strategies that we develop with companies and, and work on, you start a lot of things that you start with are not there halfway, you know, a year from now. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of new things that come in, and, and your goal, as you know, is is you're playing an options game. You know, some will pay off, some won't, and you're you you try to build into a a goal that says I got to reach a certain target. So we've actually framed the domains as well as saying you want to get to the framing of you know 100 million dollars, 200, 500, depending on the size of the company. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're 120 billion dollar company, your domain future better be pretty large. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I tell companies million dollar projects aren't going to aren't going to grow the company. And then I see so many companies frittering away, you know, their their scarce resources on things that even if they're wildly successful are not going to add up to very much. Exactly. And you know, it's frustrating, it's interesting because it's really frustrating culturally in a company. I don't know how many project managers I've talked to that said, you know, when projects we said deserve a, a timely death. Um, they, 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 they look at us and say, man, I wish you would have told us this a year and a half ago. We wouldn't waste our time on it. And everybody thinks that killing projects is really a bad thing. Well, the people working on them all want to create value. So if you find a way to exit a project early so they can do something more valuable with their time, they actually appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Now you have the whole social context and, and part of the problem in big companies in particular, we love to assign big teams to do things. Yeah. And that's why, you know, when I was with our products, we said, we're not going to assign a team to do anything until we get through a couple of steps of learning that say, here's what we need. And so it's much easier at that point to, to exit a project because you haven't built an enormous team behind it. So you don't have the social implication of all right, guys, I know I put 20 of you on this project. You know, you got to go find something else to do. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the hardest things to do. Finding time so, for one person is not as hard. Exactly. So, um, you know, based on your experience, what are the biggest watchouts that people learning this need to be aware of? The biggest watchouts for it is, is the one of the biggest ones we always face is as you get into piloting things like discovery driven planning or learning plan or whatever the methodology is you're bringing in for you know uh, growth uh, in the future is it's not in addition to the work you're doing today so a lot of times we go in and people are using stage gate way too early in a project where there's a lot of uncertainty and then we come in and they say well i got to do the stage gate you know i stage gate meeting and I got to do the DDP. And so what everybody sees it as is I just doubled down on your workload that's already, you know, you're already struggling to meet. And so you need to, uh, with senior management say, the projects you're going to pilot, this is now their work. Forget the stage gate. Okay, this is what they're doing. So you have to take something off the table in terms of the process work. And that's one of the really first things. We can't confuse people and say, you're doing both in parallel. That doesn't work. You might take a project that's similar and do that one by stage gate and do another one using DDP, but they're separate projects, separate groups, separate teams. So nobody's doing twice the work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one of the first things. The other is getting senior leaders to really articulate this idea of domains and growth. Where do you want to go in the future? Right? There's that classic strategy statement from Alice in Wonderland. If you don't know where you're going, it really doesn't matter what path you take. So, so if you want to take a path around dealing with uncertainty, then you better know where you're headed. And you want to narrow it to into this domain. You know, we I remember when, you know back in the early 2000s, which seems like yesterday. Um, it, uh, we talked about bringing ideas from anywhere. All ideas were in play. I don't think that's totally true. Our experience has been, you gotta define the box you're willing to play in. And once you, we call that a domain. And once you have that strategy, then we can deal with, with 
the idea of bringing in the opportunities, assessing the opportunities, working with small investments. And even when you do, uh, you know, venture capital investing, you know, if you go into corporate uh, venture capital websites, you'll see that they actually have targeted domains. They don't call them that necessarily, but they talk about we're interested in these areas and these investments. So send us your business plans, right? But that's essentially what they're saying. And so you need to have that kind of box because nobody has unlimited resources. Nobody's willing to put all their resources on growth because they got to they got to pay the bills today, rightfully so. And and so you need to have a target and say where you're going. And then you have to have some way to balance your portfolio. As you've talked about for a long time, I still remember the plot with all the bubbles in the corner and the lower right hand corner. I could see that in my sleep sometimes. Uh, when I first saw it from you, and and it's that's not the right portfolio, nor is all the bubbles on the top right hand corner where everything's uncertain. That's a recipe for disaster. Exactly. Okay? And so, what is the right balance for my company? And that's a senior management decision. That's not somebody at the middle management levels. And so, you have to coach. You know, a lot of it deals with not just training, but coaching senior management to say, you know, what's the message you're sending to people. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to invest in the future? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the kind of the three things we see that, that, that make implementation both difficult and when it works, easy. And it's really it. easy. So I know you've got a hard stop in about five minutes. Could you spend just a couple of minutes on the Instant Ink case? On the what? The Instant Ink, the... Oh, E-Ink. Yeah, e-ink, sorry. E-ink, yeah. Uh, way back when, Air Products uh, did an investment in e-ink. And if you go back and think about it, um, what e-ink was, was an investment in a, in a flexible display market. It was, a, it was this particular kind of display that was going to be flexible, black and white, very little power, et cetera. Air Products had a lot of materials for that um, that could supply into that market. So what our electronics team did is they invested in e-ink. They took materials from our chemicals group and said, we're gonna see if we can apply them to things like the adhesives to the, to the actual display materials. And we took, we said, we did the equity investment, small equity position, very late in the inks uh, lifespan. And then um, we put one of our R&D guys in the e-ink laboratories and we had a joint development agreement. So every time we did event, uh, an equity investment, we would, we would require a joint development agreement to say, what is our strategic objective? So our strategic objective is not to be a flexible display manufacturer. It was to be a supplier to, this, to that market. E-Ink was creating not just technology, but a market. And, and, and eventually E-Ink became Amazon Kindle. Right, and he ain't got bought by Flextronics, but Air Products still had a significant supply position as a result of that work. And that was kind of the strategy in general we always had, which was you, if you think about it in terms of you know, the opportunity engineering approach where you have multiple buckets of value, you have an MPV value, which is kind of if I finish in, and do this project, I, I get X. What e ink was for Air Products was opportunity value which is option value. We made the investment, okay? We had no idea who was gonna buy them or what they were gonna do, if they were gonna go public, whatever. But we had an opportunity value in the materials for these displays that would, would go beyond e-ink if it became a more ubiquitous type of display. And that was all option value. And it was a very good, it ended up being a very profitable product for us in the long run, e-ink got sold and, and we just sold materials that, that became, and we did that in a lot of different equity investments. We did it in a, a whole bunch. And so it's kind of the idea behind, you know, if I'm gonna enter a new domain, venture capital investing is one way to do it, right? Intel, I think still does this with their venture capital. They used to invest, not necessarily in technologies, but in markets that we use their chips. Mm -hmm. So they were creating they were creating opportunity value uh, option value for themselves, and then you had abandonment value there if you wanted to sell it sell off the you know five cents on the dollar or something. Mm -hmm. If it, it didn't work out for you, yeah. yeah. If if you found that the strategies wasn't going to work, it didn't fit your strategic objective. So that's kind of how you think about it, and it's all assumption based, all DDP, you know, uh, in that option space. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us, being willing to chip in with the course. Uh, any last thoughts for our learners? No, it's, you know, it's a journey like any other journey. 
and uh, you need to start with some, I always say, willing, willing or complicit managers. You know, you, you, need, you may have to, as a leader in a company, if you're going to bring this into the company, you're going to have to co-op some senior leaders to, to help you get started and pilot it. And don't tell anybody until you have a pilot that works. Stealth mode, stealth mode. I always think of always that. Always in the stealth <laughs> mode, right? Always the, the classic example of skunk works, <laughs> even on the process side. Great. Well, Ron Parentosi, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rita. And, uh, to be continued.